Some opinions need a shout, others a whisper, and YouTube has space for them all. But there's a type of reviewer on here that looks at modern media from a shallow conservative lens that I want to look at, because I think it does a disservice to criticism while pushing an audience politically to the right. And the channel doing this that I want to highlight is The Critical Drinker. If you're not one of his nearly 2 million subscribers, The Drinker is a comedy persona critic that rants about modern movies and TV shows, detailing the ways in which he doesn't like them. And when I say modern movies and television, and typically that's the sort of terminology he uses as well, it's better understood that this isn't all movies and all television, but rather specific genres. Most often he sticks to science fiction and fantasy, which is perfectly fine, of course, those are solid genres, but it's a broad term he's using for a very specific type of movie and TV show. Let's start with a couple of recent reviews he did of some shows to give you a sense of what his videos are like, and some of the problems I have with them. But instead of trying to champion a show or movie that I liked and he didn't, I thought it'd be more interesting to contrast our opinions when we feel the same way about something. So the first one I chose was the Netflix live-action adaptation of One Piece. If you aren't familiar with One Piece, it's a manga about a pirate named Monkey D. Luffy who assembles a crew of oddball characters to find the One Piece, the greatest treasure in the world, hidden by the legendary pirate Gold Roger. Unlike most other live-action adaptations of manga and anime, One Piece is pretty darn good. But this isn't my review. Let's see what Drinker had to say in his video. One Piece succeeds where Cowboy Bebop failed. The first thing you'll notice, and right in the title, is that this review needs to be understood as coming from a certain context. While the Cowboy Bebop comparison makes perfect sense, since the show does have the same production company and both are preceded by an anime, these reviews have an even broader context than that. Who could forget the stunning non-success of Cowboy Bebop, a show that was so heavily geared towards modern audiences? Right away we're getting signifiers of who this review is for. The vague allusion to modern audiences and the post-Trump election screaming person meme from eight years ago reveal that this is a review for a conservative audience, or at the very least, someone with conservative taste in media, possibly informed by their politics. Here's an example of a more specific bit of criticism from Drinker about One Piece. The men are actually allowed to kick ass, make decisions and hold their own, rather than existing purely to get outfought and outsmarted by their female counterparts at every opportunity. This is a strange bit of criticism. Rather than appreciate the men in the series being able to kick ass, what Drinker is highlighting is how women aren't one-upping them. Which doesn't really say anything about what these strong men mean in One Piece, it's just getting points for being unlike other shows and movies by sticking to the tradition of strong men in action sequences. This is an example of criticism that's built on a narrative, one that supposedly reflects Drinker's deep understanding of movies and their production. That most of the time when a woman is strong in a movie, it's not just a flaw, but a sign of an encroaching political message. So One Piece having some men come off as strong is seen as brave defiance to that standard. While this isn't really damning of Drinker's criticism in any real way, critiquing a movie within its cultural context is perfectly fine, I'm just trying to establish where he's coming from. And also that this reading isn't entirely consistent or motivated by a careful examination of what's going on throughout the series. One Piece isn't consistently showing men stronger than women. In fact, Roronora Zoro, the green-haired guy we see kicking ass in this scene, is completely humbled in a flashback when we see him as a young boy training alongside a girl in his class, Queena. I can't beat you. Just kill me. I was curious as to why Drinker didn't mention this scene in his review, so I looked him up on a live stream talking about One Piece where he explained away this moment. Fighting like a fellow student, she's like the best and you can't beat her. And she's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I can beat you right now as a girl, but eventually you're going to be a man and I, it doesn't matter how hard I train, you're going to be bigger and faster right. and stronger than I can ever be and you're just going to be better and you're going to beat me and I can't stop that. And I thought, God damn, the feminists out there must be melting down when, <laughs> when a line like that gets said. It's like that just destroys their entire worldview. <laughs> like, but it's true. You know, the, the show is like honest about that. He loves this line not for what it is, but rather who he imagines it will bother. Again, understanding the series in a specific context. But what this also reveals is that he's missing the irony of what Queen is saying in that scene. When she says her body can't keep up with Zoro, this is proven true, but not because she's a woman, but because she dies before she gets older. And Zoro's frustration we see later isn't because he lost a friend, but because he lost a rival he was never able to beat. Going back to the scene where Queena says her body won't let her keep up with Zoro, 
his response is what really matters here. Don't make excuses. You're my goal. If you just give up, what has all our training been for? Zoro doesn't want to win because of the circumstances of his birth. He wants to win through his own hard work and effort. So he rejects the idea that Queena can't be a great sword fighter just because her body is different. And he wants to train alongside her so they can both get stronger together. One of us will become the world's greatest swordsman. Or woman. To ever live. Drinker's commentary doesn't really engage with this scene on any deeper level than a swipe at feminism, and it's something that reflects a lot of his commentary. He's willing to forgive a girl being stronger than a boy in one scene because he can point to a line that seemingly reinforces a conservative worldview. This reveals the shallowness of his criticism. Instead of trying to understand movies or TV shows on their merits, it's slotted into a larger cultural war and awarded or subtracted points on how it fits into that space with a very superficial reading. But what's more misleading is when he uses his supposed expertise to make up stories about the production of movies and TV shows. Here's another section from the One Piece review, immediately after he speculates on how the status of men was preserved. That kind of shit just wouldn't fly in Japanese culture, so it doesn't even get attempted here. And by all accounts, we mostly have Ichiro Oda, the original manga's creator, to thank for that. And to hammer home just what he's talking about here, here's him saying it again in the live stream. The girls don't automatically win everything and they're not better at everything no. like you would expect from a Disney production or whatever. Um, and I, I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that the original manga writer had the rights to this and he retained creative control. Oda being credited for making the series better than it could have been had he not been involved is perfectly valid and probably true. Though when it comes to the specifics of not letting male characters look silly, Drinker doesn't present any evidence for this. He is likely referring to a news story that came out that revealed that Oda had requested reshoots of certain scenes, but articles about these reshoots don't really go into details about what exactly was reshot, or whether or not gender dynamics were reinforced because of Oda's demands. If Drinker had bothered to take some more time to figure out why these reshoots happened, he might have actually found some information on the influence Oda had on the production. In fact, we can talk about a reshoot that was done for a scene we've already discussed, the flashback with Zoro and Quina in the fourth episode. Here's a comment from the episode's director, Emma Sullivan, from an interview she did with Cinema Daily US. There's a scene in one of my episodes between young Zoro and Quina in Shimotsuki Village. They have this fight. Oda-san watched it and he wanted us to redo it because we did it with kendo masks on. So we went back to South Africa and did it again just to make sure he was happy with it. This reveals one example of how Oda wasn't simply overseeing whether or not gender roles were preserved, but rather he wanted to make sure the characters were conveying emotions on their faces. Of course, this is just one scene. In an interview with Stephen Maeda for TV Line, Maeda revealed more of Oda's directions for the production. One of the mandates from manga creator Ichiro Oda was against romance on the crew. That is a hard no, as far as the manga and the live-action show are concerned. In a subsequent interview, Maeda also revealed another Oda mandate was to not change any of the origins of how characters got their powers from the various devil fruits. There are other examples of reshoots, including the changing of the Alvida fight from daytime to nighttime and expanding the role of Chef Zeph, though I'm not entirely sure who requested those specific reshoots. Now, the reason I highlight all these reshoots is not to give you some exhausted list of what Oda was requesting behind the scenes, but rather to demonstrate what it looks like to gather evidence when you're trying to describe what's going on behind the scenes in a production. Just throwing out random assumptions about what's going on because of your stereotypes of what a Japanese artist and an American production might be concerned with, you might assume something is happening, but it doesn't absolve you of having to do the work of actually figuring out if it's happening or not. Otherwise, you're just fueling speculation based on a narrative and not fact. And a narrative without any facts to back it up is a fantasy. One problem with Drinker's commentary is that he assumes a degree of knowledge and expertise regarding the production of projects and does none of the work of providing evidence to support those assumptions. If Drinker is going to speculate that Oda demanded that women never be shown one-upping men, he should provide at least some kind of evidence to his audience if he wants to make that claim. Here's an example of how he compares Cowboy Bebop reigning in its characters, whereas One Piece supposedly isn't. Compare it to something like Cowboy Bebop, which made a conscious effort to rein in its characters' personalities for Western audiences, trying to rewrite them as grounded and realistic. I want to quickly contrast two moments from the One Piece anime and the live-action series. Would you care for an aperitif to start? We have several rare Mikio vintages in stock, or perhaps you'd like a glass of Umeshu. You know, something sweet for... Someone sweet. Something wrong with your eye? Just blinded by your beauty. Oh, oh dear, oh 
ocean. Thank you for this treasure you have shared from your depths. Huh? Ah, yes, my love. I can't bear this hardship of loving you from afar. It is too difficult. I am now prepared to sail to the ends of the earth as a pirate if it means someone of your rare beauty will be by my side. If that comparison isn't enough, here's a quote from another interview Emma Sullivan did, this time speaking to Screen Rant. I've watched a few of these shows and lots of different anime. I'm a big pseudo Ghibli fan, but you can't make actors do those big actions and faces that we get in the anime, so it wouldn't work. And if we tried, it would be really awkward, and I think it would throw everybody out of the story. I think what we had to do is we had to find a grounded approach, and we had to find an emotionally real approach to it. We have to kind of tap into these characters and feel what makes us relate as an audience to them. So, in other words, Drinker was wrong on this one, and it reveals this unearned confidence he speaks with. He wasn't familiar with the One Piece anime, but felt confident enough claiming that the live-action series wasn't toning down the characters. He didn't know the details of Oda's involvement with the series, but he was confident enough to speculate it would involve keeping left-wing ideals out of the series with regards to how men and women are depicted. Maybe it's unfair to expect every reviewer of One Piece to take the time to comb through interviews or watch source material that is truly epic in length, but it's also possible for a reviewer not to speculate about those things without at least attempting to do the research first, and trying to back up a claim with some kind of evidence, aside from one news article about Oda requesting some reshoots. What I'm sure people have also noticed is how this review is coded very heavily with conservative politics, from its emphasis on the men, an implicit rejection of feminism, and a general distaste for a society supposedly consumed by this dynamic. There's also this weird insistence that the show's Japanese character is what makes it itself. This observation is deeply flawed in several ways. Most notably, we're not actually comparing modern Hollywood and modern Japanese stories. One Piece debuted in 1997. It's over 25 years old at this point, so it feels like a bit of a throwback. That's because it is and the Netflix adaptation is very much trying to stick to the original narrative. And if you think Japan is some kind of haven for storytelling that steers clear of feminist or leftist themes, you clearly have no idea what shows are airing over there. Just sticking to the very narrow confines of anime, and I'm no expert in that myself. I personally recently enjoyed the newest Gundam series, The Witch from Mercury, which is a story about two space lesbians who use a pride Gundam to fight against future capitalism while echoing Sylvia Federici's feminist reading of The Tempest. There's also Vinland Sagan's critique of toxic masculinity and cycles of violence to set its characters on journeys of restorative justice, and also the impact of capitalism on the colonial project. Or we could talk about One Piece. Well, let's just say it has distinctly leftist plot twists in the future. Also, they're literally fighting the sea cops. I'm not even saying any of these shows I just highlighted are emblematic of mainstream Japanese culture. These are just relatively popular shows that I happen to enjoy. There's a vast diversity of art created in Japan, and it deserves more than this fetishized, anti-feminist construction that Drinker is placing upon it. To get a better sense of what Drinker's videos are like when he doesn't like a series, I want to highlight his review of the recent Marvel TV series, Echo. This is from the video, Echo, Another Marvelous Mess. For the unfamiliar, Echo is the story of Mayo Lopez, a deaf woman of the Choctaw Nation who loses her mother and part of her leg at a young age. When the kingpin secretly murders Maya's father, Maya is adopted and becomes his eventual assassin, cutting her off from her family. The story picks up from Kingpin's supposed death at Maya's hands, and Maya returning to her hometown and reconnecting with her past and her family. I want to highlight this bit of criticism because it reinforces how Drinker is more interested in speaking to his audience's distaste for Marvel movies through a standardized talking point. The tough, self-reliant girl boss protagonist who can beat up men twice her size and inspires fanatical loyalty in everyone around her, despite being a completely unlikable arsehole who gets innocent people killed. Calling Echo a girl boss is to completely miss one of the major plot points of the series. Early on, when Echo believes that Kingpin is dead, she decides she's going to be the Queenpin, taking over the Kingpin's territory. Her family is quick to tell her that this is a terrible idea, and as the series progresses, she realizes that that it's true, and she gives up any dreams of becoming a female crime boss. Echo is a series that is about rejecting the idea of being a girl boss, or in this case, a girl crime boss. But I'm not sure Drinker really knows what girl boss means, or at least he uses it in a way that is more about physical violence when he mentions that Maya beat up a lot of large men. 
that actually has nothing to do with being a girl boss, which is more about succeeding in business. But since girl boss is a term associated with left-wing social issues, he uses it here anyway. I guess he's unaware that there's a lot of leftist critiques over the term girl boss, and it's actually reflective of a very modest centrist position these days, which really says more about how far right Drinker is on this issue. But even just looking at Echo's ability to kick ass, she isn't as overwhelmingly powerful as Drinker seems to imagine. Not only does she not win the first fight we see when she goes up against Daredevil, she also gets captured and at the end of a big fighting set piece, her family only survives because of the Kingpin's mercy. And in the final scene, she doesn't beat up the much larger Kingpin, instead she uses her powers to make him confront his own personal trauma. Echo's story is not about her being a physical powerhouse, but rather her learning how violence actually isn't the answer to all of her problems. She does kick some ass, but that's because it's a superhero show and it'd be very weird for the superhero who is the title character to not win at least a couple of fights. I don't know how having a loving family counts as fanatical loyalty, as Maya's families are the only ones who lift a finger to help her, and often in the most modest of ways. Maya's grandfather repairs her artificial leg, her grandmother explains some visions she's been having, and her cousin Biscuit takes her out on a drive. That last one does get pretty intense, and you might call it fanatical loyalty, as he ends up helping Maya rob a train, but that's not what Biscuit signed up for. Maya tricked him into helping her. He had no idea they were going to be robbing a train. Maya's uncle also tries to cover her when she starts messing with the Kingpin's operation, but I don't think it counts as fanatical loyalty, trying to keep your niece from getting killed. And her uncle isn't stepping up to a crime boss out of nowhere. He runs part of Kingpin's operation in the area. Maybe Drinker imagines that Maya's family should blame her for working for the Kingpin, but that's not really true. They blame her father for bringing her into that life. Though Maya herself is not excused from her rejection of her cousins, the ones who had no say in whether or not Maya would be welcomed back, and Maya basically turned her back on having any sort of relationship with her family on her own. A big part of the series is about moving past these condemnations towards one another to reconcile this family and realize their love for one another is more important than misdeeds of the past. Going back to Drinker's video, I don't think a single one of his fans was surprised that he didn't enjoy Echo. His entire channel is built on hating Disney properties, which is fine. You don't have to like Disney, no one does. But his readings of these shows don't really demonstrate any attempt to understand them. Rather, they're an opportunity to signal that he's anti-Disney to his audience. You might even call it a message he consistently feels the need to include in each of his videos. This really reflects the problem I have with the reviews of his I watched. While you can get an honest, albeit sometimes worryingly reactionary opinion, anything related to Disney or some other conservative boogeyman will invariably lead back to stock criticisms to appeal to his audience more than trying to understand a work on its own merits. Here's an example of something genuinely cool Drinker missed in his review of Echo. Some of the actors use purely sign language to communicate, which works fine, but others talk along with it. But because they have to slow down for their hand gestures to keep up with what they're saying, their dialogue comes across as weirdly jittery and stilted, and it usually clashes horribly with the tone of the scene. Just like in real life, some people are better than others at signing, but this isn't simply an attempt to depict American sign language realistically. What these varying levels of sign language reflect are someone's proximity and closeness to Maya, from her mother being completely fluent, to her cousin Biscuit being decent, to Kingpin not bothering to learn it at all. It was pretty clever, and it's another example of how Drinker often misses subtlety. While the performances may not have been smooth in his mind, to me I personally thought all the actors carried these things off pretty well and seeing them struggle or not struggle to communicate with Maya enhances the scene rather than serve as a distraction. Looking at these examples, I'm trying to establish how the critical drinker views media through a very specific lens, one that assumes an insider knowledge he doesn't have, or at least he doesn't evidence, an affinity towards conservative political messages, and a commitment towards superficial readings to reinforce a general anger towards specific companies and certain types of politics. This becomes especially apparent in his series why modern movies suck. The series is what the title says it is, each video highlighting a very specific reason why Drinker thinks modern movies suck. As seen in many of these videos, Drinker has a very specific perspective on what makes a movie good, shaped by his own personal lens. Let's look at how Drinker discusses women in movies and TV. In The Strong Female Character video from this series, it starts with some very clear observations of how these characters are used as marketing tools to present movies as having some kind of moral character to their production. And if this were a video about the shallow and cynical marketing of modern movies, we'd have no problem. But 
This drifts from that observation to an outright hostility of these characters for reasons that have nothing to do with marketing. Drinker's gripe with these types of female characters is that they supposedly experience no personal growth and are therefore not good characters. What strong female characters tend to focus on instead is self-actualization. The idea that she already has everything she needs to succeed and all that's required is to let go of the limitations imposed on her by others. The message to the audience is simple. You're perfect the way you are and it's the rest of the world that has to change. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of these characters. The personal growth experienced by them is related to confidence and learning about how not to feel shame about who they are. That is, becoming bold enough to say that women are not lesser than men. Not that they're perfect the way they are, but that they're not inferior in a way that society tells them that they are. Someone going from timid and afraid to bold and assertive is a form of personal growth. He follows up his observation with this bit of commentary on Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel forcefully removing the control chip that keeps her powers contained. It's a symbolic gesture of the strong, empowered woman throwing off the shackles imposed on her by society so that she can realize her true potential. It's a nice idea that probably had the writers patting themselves on the back, but the problem is that when you remove struggle, failure, weakness, and vulnerability, you don't leave the audience with a whole lot to empathize with. It's very strange to say this when this event happens at the end of the movie, which is, you know when a character arc is typically completed. The empathy we're supposed to be feeling with Captain Marvel is her struggle throughout the movie. Her removing that ship is her completing her journey. If she started off the movie like this, smashing that ship and then just kicking ass for an hour and a half, he might have a point. It makes me think that this reading is motivated by something other than a clear and level-headed analysis of a story on its own merits. Things get even worse when Drinker reduces his criticism to complaining about women beating up men. The problem is, you're always going to have a tough time selling a fight between a man and a woman on screen, for obvious reasons. Men are generally bigger, stronger and more robust, with denser and heavier bones, stronger muscles, broader shoulders, longer limbs and superior upper body strength. The Critical Drinker largely reviews superhero, science fiction and fantasy movies. Usually the problems that need to be solved in these movies involve punching something in the face, often in unbelievable fashion. Not all of them do this, of course, but he seems to have a problem when this is done in a movie where a woman is the lead. This is when discussions of realism often come up, and to me at least, they always ring completely hollow. It may be unusual since so much of movie history doesn't include women beating up men, but it's not really any more unrealistic than pretty much any action sequence where we see a man doing things that are humanly impossible. This is an example of two guys who are absolutely wrecking a bar full of other men. There is some back and forth, sure, but in the grand scheme of things, this is completely unrealistic. A bar fight would never go down like this. Here's something to ask yourself. When was the last time you saw one person beat up two people in real life? I know most of us don't see many fights in real life, but the fact is, it's incredibly difficult to do that. I'm not saying it's never happened, but it's very unlikely. And if we look at your standard action movie, we see heroes take on way more than two. Often, dozens of people are fought at once. Or when we see various action stunts of our hero doing stuff that has no basis in reality, physical feats that no human could do, we simply take it as a given that this is the world of movies and sometimes the action is exaggerated or a complete fantasy. It seems strange that someone is all of a sudden breaking open the science books and trying to use science to differentiate between men and women as if it would somehow be more believable if a man could beat up 20 people at once than a woman beating up 20 people at once. It doesn't really matter to me that a man would last a tenth of a second longer than a woman if he was fighting all those people at once. I don't think it's simply your brain not being able to understand things in a logical, scientific way, but rather because you're more willing to believe one fantasy over another. And why someone believes one fantasy over another isn't really being considered. The only reason men doing this stuff seems normal and regular is because movies and TV shows have been doing this for decades, and it reflects the political reality of how this media was made in the past. It was largely made by men, and it was targeting an audience that was largely men, so it was playing up to a male fantasy on the screen. That we're now seeing female versions of this in the modern day isn't any better or worse. It's simply a variation on the same type of wish fulfillment and fantasy that people like to put into movies. If this fantasy is less appealing to you personally, that's fine, but it says nothing about these movies and rather the mindset you have going into these movies. And I think this undercurrent explains a lot of Drinker's criticism. He has uncritically accepted the movies and TV shows of his youth as normal. 
and internalize their often conservative messaging, at least by today's standards. He sees deviations not a reflection of changing tastes and times, but some kind of top-down imposition as some kind of abnormal intrusion. Here's an example of how Drinker talks about the personality of these strong female characters and how they embody more masculine traits. Instead of being altruistic or compassionate or protective or vulnerable or quirky, they're almost always written as stoic, emotionally closed off, blunt, dismissive, prickly, domineering or aggressive. The very same masculine traits that the writers seem to find so toxic and unacceptable in men. He goes on to say that these traits aren't enough to make a character and that these women would be more interesting if they were more robust, including more traditionally feminine traits. The irony of this is that in another series, They Hate Men Part 1, he takes the opposite approach to male characters. A stoic character is one that's generally reserved and emotionally distant, the kind of person who bears their troubles and discomforts without too much complaining. It's a character type most commonly associated with traditional ideas of masculine behaviour. Why? Because that's how men generally act around each other. There's a big disconnect here. Whereas men being stoic is okay, women characters can only be stoic if they also include a number of other traits. That is, it's a positive for men, and at best, neutral for women. It's a pretty clear example of the double standard in much of Drinker's commentary. And this one is similarly guided by some very rigid ideology, where media of the past is simply seen as normal, and media of the present is seen being shaped by ideology. The truth is, all media is shaped in some way by the ideologies of the people creating it. Then Drinker notices one and not the other really just reveals how he looks at these various productions, and his very limited ability to step outside of his own experience. The result is a kind of frustrating, neutered, childlike interpretation of male behaviour that doesn't really line up with what real, normal people experience day to day. Personally, I find that I can't relate to more and more male characters in movies today because they simply don't talk, act or look like any of the men I've actually known in my life, and they're definitely not something I'd want to aspire to. This is an incredible confession. This should make him realize that perhaps his perspective is a limited one, that he might want to consider viewpoints of others who are identifying with these characters, or maybe simply accept that there are experiences outside of his own that he might not be able to understand, and that these movies perhaps often an entry point to understanding these different perspectives. To reject them for being different, or unfamiliar, or simply not being normal, only reveals how close-minded he is towards experiences that are unlike his own. And instead of trying to understand these unfamiliar experiences, he's created a video for the internet to complain that these characters are destroying movies. To agree with Drinker means to agree with an inherently conservative worldview, where male-led fantasies are more associated with quality and normalcy than female-led fantasies. It's not that women aren't allowed to be action heroes, but rather must operate under a double standard and have a limit to what they can be seen doing. It's about preserving a space where women can excel, but never equal the status of men, and certainly never excel at the expense of a beloved male character. To see this lens in action, I want to choose one of my favorite examples. Or Jean-Luc Picard, the cultured, intelligent, clear-headed diplomat, capable leader and brave explorer from Star Trek The Next Generation, once the epitome of the thinking man's hero, now reduced to a confused, frail old man who needs to be put firmly in his place by someone more diverse. Sheer f***ing hubris. Yeah, that'll teach you to get ideas above your station, Jean-Luc. Let's get the most controversial thing I'll say in this video out of the way. I love the first season of Star Trek Picard. Anyone who's watched the series is probably having a very normal reaction right now. But I want you all to take a break from that so we can go back to the scene where the Admiral supposedly puts Captain Picard in his place. Here's a little more context. There was a choice between allowing the Federation to implode or letting the Romulans go. The Federation does not get to decide if a species lives or dies. Yes, we do. We absolutely do. Thousands of other species depend upon us for unity. I was standing up for the Federation, for what it represents, for what it should still represent. How dare you lecture me? Ignore me again at your cost. This is no longer your house, Jean-Luc. So do what you're good at. Go home. This scene isn't anything new. The Star Trek The Next Generation TV series, where we first met Picard, has countless examples of him being dressed down by male and female admirals, sometimes justified, sometimes not. In this scene in Picard, we see his plan being utterly rejected by the admiral, but we're meant to sympathize with Picard. 
One of the themes of the first season of Picard is how Starfleet as an institution has abandoned its principles, and is put in its own desire to maintain its power and survival ahead of the ideals it claims to represent. It's an example of how an institution becomes more concerned with perpetuating itself rather than serving the function it claims to have in the first place. What the audience is supposed to get here is that Picard is now an outsider to that institution, but not because he has become weak, but rather it's the institution he once represented that has become weak. That's why this scene is sad. Or you can reduce it to a woman yelling at a man and see it as a symbol of emasculation. But to me, that's a very reductive reading, not attempting to understand any of the subtlety or nuance that's happening in this scene. Therefore, this reading of Picard is not really engaging with the series at all. It's just using it as a tool to reinforce a narrative that media is telling society that men should be subservient to women. Although if it sounds like I'm stretching a bit there, and you don't believe that the drinker is trying to imply that movies and TV are offering moral lessons, I want to look at another video from this series on the subject, titled, They Teach Us Awful Lessons. This video is very explicitly critiquing the morality of modern movies, and hypothesizing how this will have a negative impact on society. But the problem with modern movies is that I've begun to notice the moral scale tipping in the wrong direction, trying to frame negative actions, decisions and messages in a positive light. Basically what this means is they're teaching people really shit lessons now, and if this sort of thing continues for too long, it's going to produce an entire generation of shitty people. Trinker doesn't just see movies as a form of light entertainment. He believes they have an impact on the moral development of society. I'm not trying to suggest that he's saying movies are shaping how we understand the world entirely, just that they have an influence. The bulk of the They Teach Us Awful Lessons video uses the example of Mulan, contrasting the animated and live-action versions of the movie. I want to first highlight his reading of the animated version. The struggles and eventual successes of the main character demonstrate the value of determination and perseverance even when the odds are against you. That a person's worth isn't defined by the size of their muscles, and even if you're not as big and strong as other people, it doesn't mean that you can't go on to achieve great things. It's all about playing the hand that you're dealt, even if that hand doesn't seem as strong as other people's. First off, that line at the very end about the hand you're dealt makes it sound like Mulan was living with some kind of disability. She wasn't. She was limited in society because she was a woman. And last I checked, being a woman is not a disability. And that fact should tell you something about what the movie is trying to say about society and how it treats women. Drinker's reading is instead fixated on Mulan's supposed physical limitations and doesn't really remark on the social pressure put on her to conform to a gender role. There are parts of the movie that Drinker just gets flat wrong. Like the other recruits, she gets put through some rigorous training to teach her how to be a soldier, and because she's smaller and weaker than the others, naturally she struggles to keep up with them. Mulan struggles during boot camp, but it's very clearly shown in the montage it's not strictly because she's a woman. Everyone struggles, and everyone is failing at it. And if anything, the bullying by the other recruits makes things even tougher on her. As the montage progresses, the turning point is Mulan being the only person to figure out how to get the arrow off the top of the tree trunk. It not only gives her the resolve to continue her training, but it inspires everyone else and they stop bullying her. We then see everyone else start to do better in the training, and Mulan not only keeps up, we see her excelling. She's faster than all the men and strong enough to take out her teacher. She doesn't appear to have any sort of physical limitation here. But this falls into the trap Drinker is in when discussing these movies. His understanding is limited to Mulan's personal agency as a character. He doesn't have much to say about the world she finds herself in, and what it means to limit a capable woman like her. He frames Mulan's journey as wanting some kind of adventure, when it's more accurate to say she wants to live more as her true self, something I thought was made clear in one of the movie's opening songs. Mulan didn't join the army as part of some desire for adventure. She was trying to protect her father from being conscripted, and her training didn't teach her to be smart and resourceful. She had those qualities from the opening of the movie. Hard work and perseverance are nice qualities to have, but the movie is so much more than that. It's a movie about a woman pretending to be a man in a society that only sees women as brides and mothers. It's making a very strong feminist statement here. But here's Drinker's take on the modern Mulan, which makes many of the same points. She's just as fast, just as strong, just as good at fighting as the others. In fact, if anything, she's probably better than them, because she was born with high levels of chi or something, which allows her to perform feats of agility and skill that border on the supernatural. So basically, all the challenges and problems that made life so difficult 
make up for the original Mulan are pretty much non-existent here. And well, it kind of undermines what used to be a pretty inspiring message. The main challenge Mulan faced in the animated version was living in a society that trapped her in a restrictive gender role. The exact same challenge that live-action Mulan faces. By reducing the story to Mulan's physical abilities, Drinker misses a huge portion of the movie, and the obvious message of fighting against a system that won't let her taste the freedom to be who she wants to be. Getting away from Mulan, I do want to briefly mention the weird reading of WandaVision where Drinker seems to think it's trying to glorify Scarlet Witch's imprisonment of a whole town because of her grief. The idea that your own personal happiness is literally more important than other people's freedom, well-being, and personal integrity. This is the worldview of a villain, not a f***ing hero. I'm genuinely shocked to hear that reading, because he clearly gets what the whole series was about. It was Scarlet Witch's villain origin story. The fact that you feel sympathy for her doesn't excuse her actions. If anything, they're trying to create a more complicated understanding of a villain, one where they aren't simply reviled, but empathize with while rejecting how they operate in the world based on that state. But he's framing it as if Scarlet Witch was meant to be the hero of the series. When we see townsfolk suffering under Wanda's spell, we are meant to empathize with them and see how Wanda's coping is victimizing other people. The next time we see her, she's a villain in the Doctor Strange movie. That wouldn't be a surprise to anyone who was paying the least bit of attention, but Drinker's reading is so uncharitable that he's inferring the show was trying to do something it wasn't, or that it's trying to impart some kind of lesson for your own grief superseding the suffering of others. We're instead teaching people to be arrogant, complacent, entitled, narcissistic, and selfish. These are shitty lessons designed to produce shitty people that are destined to crash and burn once they get out into the real world. Or even worse, invade it in large enough numbers that they actually start to dilute the culture and make it just as shitty as them. These final thoughts are probably Drinker's videos at their silliest. But to then use that reading as a way of describing movies leading to the downfall of society echoes the most ridiculous of conservative fear-mongering. I do believe art can have a powerful transformative effect on people, but we should be careful not to assign the ability to completely change society to a handful of Disney movies. There is a grander narrative at play in these videos, and this is the part that gets very close to making a good point. Trinker spends a lot of time talking about the conflicts between movie studios and the fans of a particular character or franchise. The term fans here should be understood not as everyone in the audience, or even the most enthusiastic, but rather a subset of the audience that has assumed the mantle of the most devoted. This isn't necessarily true. Fandom comes in many forms. But to this particular group, there is a firm belief that they not only love a piece of media the most, but they love the purest and most accurate version of that media. This is structured in a very deliberate way in the They Hate Their Own Fans video. It explains the plot being used by studios to engineer outrage with the term fan baiting. They're practically falling over themselves to antagonize their own fans these days and farm the resulting controversy for everything it's worth. The idea being presented here is that studios are taking the most extreme examples of outrage over creative decisions and using those to deflect from criticism. Trinker does at least try to differentiate his critiques from those whose anger lead them to harass and threaten actors, using the example of Leslie Jones from the 2016 Ghostbusters movie. There were plenty of legit reasons to criticize both the character and the actor, none of which had anything to do with the color of her skin, but naturally, the media chose to focus in on the small minority of racist assholes who did exactly that. While it's nice to hear Drinker call these people racist assholes, it rings a bit hollow when later in the video he suggests the studio is making these casting decisions on purpose specifically to eventually generate this kind of outrage. Or how about Moses Ingram from Obi-Wan Kenobi, who was apparently briefed in advance by Lucasfilm that she'd be getting racist hate from toxic fans, almost like they were counting on it happening. This plot is also used to explain why critics praise certain movies, predicated on the idea that since the critic and audience scores don't match or aren't very close on Rotten Tomatoes, there must be some form of nefarious foul play coming from studios threatening critics. Ever wondered why critic and audience scores look like they're reviewing completely different movies these days? It's because it's easier to take the safe option and praise the things you're expected to praise, rather than risk voicing your true opinions. What's notable about this critique is Drinker seems to think this is coming all the way from the top, that the studios have so little confidence in making a good movie that people will want to see on its merits, that they introduce diversity and therefore weaker performances in order to create controversy and transform watching that movie into a political statement. They chose to turn their show into some kind of cultural flashpoint in the hopes that it would deflect attention and criticism away from what they'd actually produced. Without a doubt, marketing for some of these movies leans into the controversies that are generated online. 
But Drinker is imagining something far more grand than trying to game social media. Much of his theory is predicated on the idea that these movies are reaching some sort of objective standard of bad quality, something that studios and critics are all aware of, but not willing to say. It's the subtle suggestion that Drinker is unwilling to believe that someone might like a movie or TV show that he believes is bad, because he's deduced some kind of objective metric for determining whether something is of good or bad quality. Drinker's whole Why Modern Movies Are Bad series reflect this rules-based approach to making movies, positioning himself as the referee as to whether or not these rules are being followed. Only, the rules are subjective, and so are their application, as he himself will often admit to in his videos when he points out several exceptions. Ultimately, all this really reflects is his own personal taste in movies. And like I've said several times in this video, it's fine to not like some movies, there is no problem with that. But not catering to your taste personally doesn't mean it's the downfall of cinema, or this will lead to some kind of disastrous consequences for society. It also doesn't mean that your tastes are emblematic of fandom either. What really undercuts the narrative here, though, is that he seems to think all of this is a new phenomena. That it's only recently that movies have started pushing diversity or relying on old franchises, or are trying to contradict what he considers traditional values. He says it all started in 2016. It all began in the year of our Lord, 2016, with the release of the rebooted Ghostbusters movie. Before continuing, I want to go back to the strong female character video. He opens it with a rundown of various strong female characters that he believes are good. And there was one name in this video that caught my attention. Cara Thrace. For those unfamiliar, Cara Thrace is one of the main characters in the 2003 version of Battlestar Galactica a show I happened to be watching for the first time while researching this video, and when looking up some of the history of the show, a few interesting facts came to light. As a fighter pilot on the show, Kara's call sign is Starbuck. This is a reference to the character Starbuck from the original 1978 version of Battlestar Galactica, played by Dirk Benedict. As you might notice, this character is an obvious gender swap from the original. The 2003 version creator, Ronald D. Moore, explains in an interview that this was a controversial decision at the time. The rogue friend who smokes cigars and chases girls and gambles. I don't know what to do with that. How do you make that interesting today? And somewhere along the line, my brain just went, well, what if Starbuck was a woman? Yes, sir. There were starting to be female pilots in the war against terror at that time. You were starting to see women in combat for the first time. So it was a fairly new thing to see that dramatized. In other words, Moore swapped the character's gender to update her for a modern audience. The exact thing Drinker complains about. And back then, there was also a backlash. And that became like a whole thing in and of itself. How dare you? you you're, you're destroying, you know, Battlestar Galactica and this is blasphemy and so on. And you know what? It just helped us. The controversy helped us. It helped propel the show. It played into marketing and promotion. I was glad. I was glad to stoke it. And yeah, keep arguing about it. Let's keep talking about it. Get more of these stories in the press. What I'm hoping is clear here is that Moore doesn't describe wanting to stoke that controversy while creating the character, but rather leaning into it once it started. But this gets even better because in 2006, three years after Battlestar Galactica started and a whole new generation of fans were embracing this new version of Starbuck, and 10 years before that 2016 origin point that Drinker gave us, we got a blog post from Dirk Benedict, the original Starbuck. His words may sound a bit familiar, and I'll play a few clips if you need some reminders. This is taken from the actor's own website, and it's going to be a lot, but I promise it's worth it. The title of this blog post is Starbuck, Lost in Castration. There was a time, I know I was there, when men were men, women were women, and sometimes a cigar was just a good smoke but 40 years of feminism have taken their toll. The war against masculinity has been won. Reimagining, they call it. Unimagining is more accurate. Take what once was and twist it into what never was intended so that a television show based on hope, spiritual faith, and family is unimagined and regurgitated as a show of despair, sexual violence, and family dysfunction to better reflect the times of ambiguous morality in which we live, one would assume. One thing is certain, in the new, unimagined, reimagined world of Battlestar Galactica, everything is female-driven. The male characters, from Adama on down, are confused, weak, and racked with indecision, while the female characters are decisive, bold, angry as hell, puffing cigars, gasp, and not about to take it anymore. They're almost always written as stoic, emotionally closed off. Blunt, dismissive, prickly, domineering, or aggressive. The very same masculine traits that the writers seem to find so toxic and unacceptable in men. They will tell you it is, still, about story and character, 
but all it is really about is efficiency, about the formula. Because Harvard Business School technocrats run Hollywood, and what technocrats know is what must be removed from all business is risk. And I tell you, life, real life, is all about risk. Rather than taking a risk on smaller, riskier, and more diverse projects, they tend to blow their load on whatever's popular right now. I tell you, without risk, you have no creativity, no art. I tell you that without risks, you have remakes, you have Charlie's Angels, The Saint, Mission Impossible, The A-Team, coming soon. Battlestar Galactica, all risk-free brand names, franchises. You resurrect dusty old franchises with inbuilt fan bases and strong name recognition and hope that it'll somehow translate into financial success. You, your instincts, your judgments are wrong. McDonald's is the best hamburger on the planet. Coca-Cola the best drink. Stardo is the best Viper pilot in the galaxy. And Battlestar Galactica, contrary to what your memory tells you, never existed before the reimagination of 2003. Much of that could have been lifted directly from a critical drinker script, huh? The full blog post even makes references to soy lattes at one point. But where the blog post is actually a little more self-aware is that it realizes this criticism isn't unique, and that Benedict noticed he was under the same pressures that existed back in the 1970s, and that his performance of a roguish skirt chaser Starbuck was a throwback for that era too. Although he and Drinker are both wrong in the same way. Not that Hollywood is suddenly trying to avoid risks and maximizing profits. It kind of has always been that way. Hence, eras where we saw dozens of westerns and musicals. And other trends that studios would ride and make as much money off of as they could. This outrage is hardly new. And certainly wasn't new in 2006 either. Although the internet obviously wasn't quite as widespread as it is now, you can still find old forum threads complaining about a liberal agenda popping up in Star Trek. It certainly wasn't as widely publicized or shared because social media certainly wasn't a thing, and we were still years away from giant video sharing sites like YouTube, blasting this kind of anger to billions of people around the world. Still, there are plenty of examples of fans who are angry about supposed liberal or left-wing indoctrination being inserted into their movies and TV shows. An article previewing an upcoming documentary on Star Trek Voyager describes some of the outrage at Star Trek's first female captain. It reads, Producer Lolita Faccio said that even though social media didn't exist and email wasn't widely used, they received so much angry, threatening hate mail about Janeway. The fax number had been leaked and Faccio said the machine was going constantly. And in interviews, Garrett Wang has described that the hate got so bad there were even death and bomb threats sent to the studio. There are also plenty of fans who loved seeing the first female captain in Star Trek. A fact the production team can speak to as well. The same way there are fans who love seeing the queer representation in Star Trek Discovery, or the Afrofuturism of Black Panther, or a female-led MCU movie with Captain Marvel. Are these fans being baited? Or perhaps these fans simply being given something they want to see? And if so, does the joy they get simply not count? Are they not allowed to be part of the fandom? I'm not even suggesting that these fan bases turning up are driving the success of any of these titles. In the same way, I don't think fans like Drink or Skipping a Title is driving failure. Complicated market forces and entertainment dynamics likely have a lot more to say about that. But what's really frustrating about Drinker's commentary here is the obvious subtext regarding fan gatekeeping, reducing the whole idea of fandom to people like him. He uses the vague term of the fans rather than something more specific, because if he were more accurate, he'd reveal that he represents not all of the fans, or even a majority, but a very persistent subset that has been resisting greater representation in media for decades. To paraphrase Battlestar Galactica, all of this has happened before, and all of this is happening again. The sliver of truth found in Benedict Trinker and every other complaint about how appealing to modern audiences is somehow ruining movies and TVs is that it's motivated by business concerns. Trinker himself says it when he remarks, Truly, there was no ploy or gambit, no matter how dirty or desperate, that they wouldn't try to use to sell this movie. Yes, the studios behind Ghostbusters and every other movie are doing everything they can to market it, and professing to have a social conscience has existed for decades. This isn't new, and it isn't a sign that a movie will definitely be bad. It's simply a reflection of the major villain in all of this. The commodification of art has poisoned the minds of everyone involved. From studios reducing creative work to commodities that are structured to maximize profits and shaped to fit as mainstream an audience as possible, and reviewers who are overly concerned with franchise integrity and see the audience as customers to be served. It's the inescapable capitalism brains that poisons our appreciation of art. 
even in these confines, there are examples of movies and TV shows that make very powerful and moving artistic statements. But at the end of the day, we're talking about productions that are produced by giant entertainment companies that are concerned chiefly with making a lot of money. I'm not going to pretend that this whole capitalism brain thing hasn't impacted me either and my appreciation of some of these works. But as someone who engages in a bit of media criticism now and then, I try not to get so swept in as to think that this is all normal or that my voice is representing the masses, even if a few of my videos get over a million views on YouTube. Although Drinker's critiques are a hollow echo of conservative fan outrage, in spite of how he tries to present it as something new, there's a part of his work that I find even more bothersome. In the They Hate Their Own Fans video, he almost seems aware of his role in all of this. Actual fans get so burned and pissed off with the treatment of their franchise that they go into it with the worst possible outlook, determined to find problems and unwilling to even give it a fair chance. Trinker is the one fomenting this when he spreads this endless negativity to his audience with his reviews, reinforcing a politically conservative reading as more acceptable than any sort of leftist or progressive one. His criticisms often don't amount to more than a few superficial observations tied to a thumbs up or thumbs down. For all his complaints about heavy-handed messaging in modern movies, his videos are just as guilty, and it becomes so much more apparent how this works with his buddying up to the conservative media outlet, The Daily Wire. For the unfamiliar, The Daily Wire is a conservative media outlet perhaps most well-known by its top host, Ben Shapiro. They've entered into the world of entertainment to less than impressive results. I've made plenty of videos on that subject if you're curious. Drinker has reviewed several of The Daily Wire's movies, including Run, Hide, Fight, Terror on the Prairie, and Lady Ballers. For a channel that largely focuses on major releases from big studios, it's a wonder why he would waste any time at all on these much smaller releases. He's also far gentler on these movies than he is with mainstream titles. Here's how he described The Daily Wire's Lady Ballers. It's not on par with the mid-2000s classics like Dodgeball, Anchorman, or Tropic Thunder that it seems to want to emulate. This movie is very much a rough gem, the imperfect first attempt of a company that's still finding its feet as a movie studio. For anyone familiar with this movie, which yes, I have watched, the term rough gem is incredibly charitable, but the content of these reviews is almost irrelevant. To review them at all is to insert these movies in front of an audience attracted by the mainstream coverage of other reviews. One of the major strengths of conservative media isn't just generating bogus stories, but creating bogus narratives and inserting them into the news cycle, making so much noise about an issue that mainstream outlets have to pay attention, and suddenly we're debating an issue like trans women in sports, like this is a national crisis, right next to real news stories such as the ongoing genocide in Gaza. By covering the Daily Wire movies alongside mainstream titles, it's doing something similar. There's a big audience for other movies by Netflix, Disney, and other major studios. These movies are very popular, and that's why he covers them. So there is a huge number of people on YouTube looking for any sort of reviews about these movies. When they stumble upon a channel with a cute name, like The Critical Drinker, they're getting a review infused with his conservative worldview. If they stick around, they're being directed towards smaller movies like The Daily Wire, already primed to like a mediocre at best production because it wasn't produced by left-wing activists. I'm sure there's part of Drinker's audience that does care about The Daily Wire though, and to them, these movies are a big deal. And he has mentioned that there has been a demand from his audience to cover some of these movies. But if so, that says everything about the persistent audience he has. Reviewing a new Star Wars show brings people in from everywhere, but the ones who stick around either share Drinker's conservative leanings, or more worrying, are being pulled rightward because of his deeply slanted reviews and uninformed commentary. There's a great example of how this works with the video titled A Tale of Two Snow Whites, which is more or less an advertisement for the Daily Wire's version of Snow White. For those blissfully unaware of this supposed controversy, Rachel Ziegler was cast in a live-action version of Snow White. During an interview about the movie, Ziegler made a comment about updating the 1937 original to be less about Snow White being rescued by a prince, and more about her becoming a leader in her own right. This, along with a few early production pictures, has produced dozens upon dozens of outraged videos on the subject. It's a bit of a stretch to think these are all simply passionate Snow White fans expressing themselves, and instead, the same group of reactionary fans who are upset about representation in a movie that doesn't even have a release date. Drinker himself has already produced several videos on the subject, and the topic sneaks its way into other videos as well. It's very clearly one of those hot topics for a certain audience, much like the fur over Captain Marvel a few years back, a reaction to Brie Larson that was so volatile and extreme in its negativity that the movie only made $1.1 billion at the box office unlike many predictions of the controversy that these statements from Brie Larson were somehow going to take down the production. 
A Tale of Two Snow Whites cynically capitalizes on the similar Ziegler outrage, recycling the same tired interview clips while also serving as an ad for the Daily Wire production. It's the sort of video I hope Drinker got paid for by the Daily Wire to produce because, aside from squeezing more juice from a very old and tired story, it has no reason to exist other than as an ad. I actually want this one to succeed, partly because I think it's being made with exactly the kind of attitude that's sorely lacking in Hollywood today, and partly because the anarchist in me wants to see the absolute meltdown that'll engulf the mainstream media if this film somehow outperforms Disney's excretion. I mean, let's be honest, it totally isn't going to, but it's funny to think about all the same. <laughs> this animates so much of Drinker's criticism, a very bitter anti-Hollywood sentiment that a company like The Daily Wire is ready to capitalize on. He's the sort of collaborator you don't need to tell what to do because you know he'll do it anyway. Complain about Disney and modern movies while pretending your low-budget conservative competition deserves to be considered in the same breath. Like I mentioned in a previous video, low-budget rip-offs of major movies have existed for decades now, including live-action Disney ones. The Daily Wire isn't doing anything new or different here. But the reason Drinker is highlighting their Snow White and not the inevitable Asylum Pictures version is because it aligns with the conservative worldview his channel is pushing. Or I could be wrong and they're just paying him, and if so, he should probably disclose that in the video. There's a clip from an interview that Drinker did with the podcast Trigonometry a while back I want to highlight. And yes, the podcast is called that. I think it's supposed to make people on the left angry when it's actually the most embarrassing shit I've ever heard. You get a new movie or a new TV show um, by any by Disney, whether it's Star Wars or Marvel, whatever, um, that will have an old character in it, but it will usually have a couple of new characters and then they get their own spin-off movie or spin-off TV show and then that will in turn create more spin-offs and it's just this ever-expanding tree of, of more stuff. It's moments like these, or when he acknowledges how CG animators are overworked and underpaid, are there small glimpses of him nearly getting to the heart of the problem. None of the complaints Drinker highlights, whether real or imagined, are new. That he pretends they are reveal that he has no desire to consider that the movies he loved were produced by the same cynical corporate machines that produce movies today. It's how he can, intentionally or not, miss one of the major themes of a children's movie like Mulan or make complaints about women in movies that he assumes are original, but actually go back decades. He's gotten old enough to see the modern political world reflected back at him in entertainment, but refuses to consider entertainment of the past was produced in the same way. That's why changes to the source material to reflect changes in taste seem like some sort of attack. He's taken the political context of the past for granted as generally good and normal, and changes to that normal must come from hubris or arrogance or some other imagined nefarious intent. Because if it was people honestly trying to reinterpret a story to reflect what they consider positive changes in society, what does that mean about someone who never thought there was a problem to begin with? It's okay not to have realized that there were some problems with society when you were younger. You were a kid, you weren't expected to know, but now that you have the opportunity to learn, it seems like the onus is on you to educate yourself on how movies were made in the past and how that reflects similar trends in the present. There's nothing wrong with enjoying an old movie or TV show that has certain things that haven't aged particularly well. It doesn't make you a bad person. And by not holding on to those old ones, maybe you'll be more open to a modern take that provides new ways of telling those old stories that a modern audience might appreciate more. Like with Battlestar Galactica. And sure, sometimes these modern updates can stumble or outright fail in their own right. The live-action Mulan isn't as good as the original, at least to me, but its existence doesn't make the animated version vanish. Disney is more than happy to sell us two versions of the same movie. Drinker's analysis is not a new or interesting thing. He gets details wrong, he makes up stories about the production, and he rarely goes deeper than the superficial. But its conservative character has ushered the channel into massive success. He credits the rise of his channel to talking about Captain Marvel in a video while sounding a little drunk. And so he was the beneficiary of finding success riding the wave of a conservative outrage. I guess it only makes sense that he gives back by continuing that cycle of outrage himself. His channel is not really a problem, but rather reflective of a larger reactionary backlash to certain types of media. So I'm not trying to highlight him as some sort of exceptional bad, but rather representative of a much larger whole. And just know that if you're someone who's watching the Drinker's videos, you're not watching the everyman expressing his outrage at modern movies, you're watching a conservative guy expressing tired reactionary takes that have been leveled at movies for decades. While working on this video, I thought a lot about my own videos looking at classic sitcoms from 20, 30, or 40 years ago. And one thing I always set out to do that hopefully comes across in those videos is not simply 
tally up all the sins and misdeeds of these projects that are many, many decades removed from their original airing. I don't think we need to ignore those things in the present day, but we similarly shouldn't let them be the end all of whether or not we enjoy an old TV show. I think the same philosophy can be held forward if you're watching a modern TV show or movie that expresses a value you don't necessarily hold. And personally, I've enjoyed a number of different things that have clearly more conservative politics informing them. One takeaway I'm hoping you're getting from this video, aside from the critical drinker not being the best source of movie and TV criticism, is that it's possible to have complicated feelings about a work of art. There is often a mixture of good and bad, and some of that is simply a reflection of the systems in place that shape these pieces of media, and sometimes it's our own personal experiences and expectations that shape our own interactions with this media. Perhaps now you're reflecting on your interaction with this piece of media, this video, and you're thinking, I rather enjoyed that. I'd like to see more of it. Well, you can help support this channel by becoming a patron or a member. You'll get early access to videos, your name in the credits, and a couple of fun bonuses I have cooking up for members in the future. But if you would like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, and spread it around on social media. Why not? And if you're wondering what kind of comment to leave below, how about just telling me your favorite movie or TV show that you're confident I've never heard of. I want your best hidden gems. Uh, I might even watch one or two of them, depending on what my schedule looks like. Thank you all so much for watching.